Welcome to Dracina Wines Podcast. Our wines plus your moments equals great memories. I'm your host, Lori, and this is a podcast about all things wine. Did you know that Dracina Wines now has a wine club? We named it the Chalk Club. Draco is on our label, but Vegas was getting a little jealous, so we decided he deserved to be our club spokes dog. In Las Vegas, betting chalk means that you are betting on all of the favorites. We are betting that we are one of your favorite wineries, so we thought the name was apropos. The club is simple, yet a bit different than most. When you wager on us, we will ship you three bottles of wine twice a year, once in April and once in September. You can choose all red or mix of red and rosé. You immediately receive 15% off of all your wine purchases throughout the year, but what makes our club stand out is the progressive discount. Let your club membership ride into the next year. Your discount increases. Each year you parlay your membership, you receive an additional 5% off up to a planned maximum of 25%. Your club shipments are discounted to a flat $15, plus we'll cover your club shipping cost for your second shipment. That's $15 house money in a sure bet for you. So please head to our website, dracinawines.com, and find out all of the benefits of joining the Chalk Club and how to sign up. We've stacked the odds so that you can get our award-winning wines without breaking the bank. Hey everyone, thanks for joining in to today's episode. Today, in this Wine Writers Wrap-Up, we are discussing bias against packaging. People have bias. There's nothing we can do about that. But do you have bias against wine packaging? What's your thoughts on screw caps, boxed wines, critter labels, and the most recent craze, 40 ounce wine? Do you choose a bottle by your palate or is there a bias behind your decision? So uncork, unscrew, or saber that bottle and connect with us as my wine writer friends and I discuss wine packaging bias. Hey everybody, welcome to this month's Wine Writers Wrap Up. We are talking about bias against packaging. And my guests tonight are Tina Moray, who is the owner of Wine Studio, a wine education and grassroots marketing program that provides a platform where wine writers, industry and consumers taste and discuss highlights, highlighted brands. Wine Studio's message is interactive wine education, thus a better understanding of our world through wine and our part in that world. So thanks for coming, Tina. Next is Debbie Giaquindo, the Hudson Valley Wine Goddess, is a certified wine specialist and wine location specialist in Port and Champaign and has a background in travel, radio marketing, and community relations. She is also the author of Tapping the Hudson Valley, chairperson of the Hudson Valley Wine and Spirits Competition, co-owner of Happy Bitch Wines, co-owner of the new restaurant, (laughs) I don't know where she finds all of her time, Kitchen 330, and my co-host, Wine for Bed Street, which is a free monthly wine education program. So, hey, Deb. And we have Nicole Ruiz Hudson, who is a food and drink writer and educator living in Oakland, California, a culinary school graduate and lover of all things wine. She has a particular passion for wine pairing. She holds the WSET diploma and is a certified sommelier. She spent three years in the tasting department at Wine Spectator and regularly contributes to 820 recipe and pairing series on winespectator.com. So, hi, Nicole. Thanks for joining us. This is your first visit to the Wine Writers Wrap Up. So, welcome, welcome. And I am Lori Budd. My husband and I 
um, own Dracina Wines, a boutique winery in Paso Robles. We specialize in Cabernet Franc. We are the founders of Cab Franc Day, and we also produce a rosé of Syrah. I write an award-winning blog and produce a podcast and co-host Wine Fet Street with Debbie. So, hi everyone. How we doing? All right, so first and foremost, what is everybody drinking? Wine from the Jura. I drank. Drank. <laughs> Andarabi Zori. K5. Isn't that skis? I decided to go on theme, and I'm drinking the Unalu Rosé from Scribe Winery in, um, out here in Sonoma. Yeah. Out of a can. Very nice. And, and I am drinking Funk Zone White Blend, which is 62% uh, Sauvignon Blanc, 36% Viognier, and 2% Chenin Blanc. And this is actually a wine from our sponsor, Wink.com. So, slancha, everybody. So if you are looking to find some new and exciting wines, we look to our sponsor, Wink, spelled W-I-N-C. Wink makes it easy to discover great wine. It doesn't get much easier. Wink has experts that know how to match your taste preferences with their wines, and they ship it right to your door, included as long as you purchase four bottles or more. It is super simple and even fun. When you first log into their website, they will have a palette profile quiz that asks you questions like, how do you like coffee? How do you feel about blueberries? When you finish the survey, Wink provides you with four wines that are curated to the, your taste. But if you don't agree, no problem. You aren't required to purchase those suggested wines. You can choose whatever you want. There's no membership fees, no obligation. You can skip months that you don't want, and you can cancel at any time. The wine start at just $13 a bottle, so Wink works with the top winemakers and growers from around the world to make their own wines. You can find amazing wines from all over. Sound interesting? Well, we have an amazing offer for our listeners. If you go to trywink.com forward slash wrap up, you will receive $22 off of your first order. That means four bottles of wine delivered to your door for less than $30. So it's Try wink w i n c dot com forward slash wrap up. All right, so let's get into it. Okay, bias against packaging. So there is a whole lot of bias out there, and things actually change over time. So I'm going to start off with probably what I think was the original bias: screw caps, screw caps versus corks, and. I, I mean, to me, that's that's probably the furthest back in my brain of what a bias was. So let's go off of that. What do we think the bias back then and how it is now? I think at first, when it, when people started using the screw caps, more, it, it cheapened the wine. People thought that the wine was cheap, that you couldn't age it. I don't think the whole thing... Um, was understood about the whole air getting into everything. So people would say, oh, that's a screw cap. That's, you know, that's a cheap wine. Now I look at a screw cap as, oh, I can just like screw that in and keep it for well, longer than the cork. Right. I, I kind of agree. I kind of feel like um, occasionally I still encounter people with the bias. Um, and granted, yes, like cracking open a screw cap is maybe less romantic, but I think in general, most people have moved past it. And from my own experience, like um, speaking to the aging point, a few years ago, I had a chance to do a um, like a vertical tasting of a bunch of Beaumard wines from the Loire Valley of Chenin Blancs. And they had been doing um, side-by-sides, like they had been um, bottling under both cork and screw cap for about a decade before they decided which one to go with. And I got a chance to taste both. And honestly, the screw caps were just like aging a little more slowly. It was way more lively. They were still aging, but um, you know, just in a in, in a slower fashion. I, it kind of 
that that comparison kind of sold me if I had any uh, remaining doubts. That's pretty impressive that uh, they've well, been doing that for yeah. ten years. That's yeah. that they. I agree. I had somewhat of a similar experience um, working in a retail environment, and it was the same thing. You really couldn't tell a difference, honestly. Um, I think that the only stigma with it is the way it looks. Um, there's also talk I remember of that um, screw caps weren't recyclable, so there was a oh. stigma based on that as well because of their lead and this and that, and depending upon how they're made. Um, but nowadays, I think they're all recyclable now. So it's been going on a while, but I, I can't remember why. Why do folks turn to screw caps from the get-go? Was it from a cost perspective? I think it depends on where you're, I think mean, there's a number of reasons. My understanding of, for example, somebody, please correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding of certain areas like the, of, like New Zealand was that they, right. since mm -hmm. they came into the um, kind of the premium wine making world kind of late, um, they, their sort of share of what they could get in terms of cork was kind of bad. Right. Um, so, plus being known for, Sauvignon Blanc screw cap just was kind of perfect for their um, for their purposes. Um, so it was kind of a double um, kind of a dual reason in that case. But I'm, I'm sure there's like lots of different. Things. Yeah. I think a lot of times that was probably the biggest. And I think for for New Zealand, they kind of streamlined the whole process um, and they opened the door for everybody else um, because first of all, marketing that like you said is so much easier, and they're doing it. To, extremely well. Um, so that's a win-win. But of course, there are a lot of people who still go the cork route and just, they're just so straight and narrow on that cork route that they can't see anything else. What do you do? That's fine. Um, so, but I'm sorry, you're going to say something? No, I was just going to kind of say that I personally also kind of love I think these maybe aren't as environmentally friendly, but I kind of love the Vino locks. I think they're just so cool. I love those. Yeah. yeah. I love those things. I have like several that just, you just clip right in. It's just, yeah. you know, I don't know. Oh my God. The Vino locks. Yeah. Those yeah. Those are great. I, um, I, I agree, Nicole. I think that I had read that it had to do with, um, the quality of the corks that they were able to get their hands on. And then that came up. I also think that as the years have gone by, um, the technology of the screw caps themselves has advanced. I think yeah. that, yeah, um, you know, that it, they used to be, you know, I'm not saying they were poor, but they used to be a lower quality. Now they are allowing aging. There's, you know, and there's different caps that you, screw caps that you can purchase for different types of of wines. Yeah, and I think jumping off of that, um, my understanding is as well that, uh, well, back in the day, um, screw caps, they didn't, they didn't necessarily know to leave a little bit of air in the bottle, and even just now, they've adjusted for that, and right. it, it allows for a fresher wine that's like, has less, that's less reductive. Right, right. exactly, yeah. yeah and that's I, a good point too. I think that has to do with anything that's kind of new you have to learn what works and what makes that you know you have this you know how this works well now i'm going to tweak it to this well now i need to figure out how to make this work the best and i think the technology has really come along but with that being said i do say you know nicole you were saying about something about or debbie about the romanticism of the cork um you know, Mike and I went out to dinner uh, over Memorial Day weekend. And I mean, Debbie, you know me the best, right? We, we're we not fancy people. You know, I, I don't, we don't do the fancy restaurants. We don't do that. But we went to a very nice restaurant that had a $25 um, corkage fee. And being from where I am in Jersey, we, we have so many bring your own restaurants. Um, that don't have corkage fees. It's just what we are used to. So we are already getting used to having to pay a corkage fee. Um, but we ordered this bottle and it was a screw cap. <laughs> and, you know, she brings the bottle over and <clears throat> here you go. And I'm like, wow, I just paid 25 bucks for you to screw, <laughs> you know, for you to unscrew that. 
and it it, it does it lo- it does lose the romanticism of you know I, I agree with you on that and then oh shoot hold on but then <laughs> it's free bird there um, but then uh, also now that they have um, tweaked the screw caps then they're, now they're talking on how it, you know when you're aging wine you don't have to worry about cork tank yes you know and that's come up a lot in a lot of readings that I've had yes I've well, had. it's actually not true you can actually get cork tank in a screw cap bottle um, it's just really really no. rare really yeah it's just like if that yeast strain yeah in there then it still can taint the wine it's just a lot less likely because it's not it's cork taint is not cork it's not right. caused by cork right 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 it's usually from a not so clean in the most part right and um but getting back to the getting back to the restaurant thing um i think a lot of people don't understand that it's they call it a corkish fee only be, because it's just been going on for so long. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's really for um, to, to house the wine, yep. um, you know, and, and this, that, and the other thing. So that's, that's basically what it was. Yeah, I, I get that, but there is, I, I don't know, I guess in me, I, you know, I'm already, I'm spoiled by growing or growing up. I'm spoiled for having 25 years of no corkage fee, you know, and now I'm paying a corkage fee. And they're, you know, like, at least open the core, you know, like I just, you know, um, but I do get it. It is, it's, it's for the glassware. It's, it's for, it's for the service. It's for, you know, the, the service people. So now Laura, you're a winemaker. So what about you? What do you prefer? So, um, our Cab Franc is in a cork, um, and it honestly will, always be in a cork because of people view the quality of it. You know, you think Cab Franc, you don't really think screw cap. Um, but our rosé is a screw cap. Um, so we we are not anywhere against screw caps. We just, you know, it's, and I, I don't think there would be anything. Is that for the aging process? Because your Cab Franc can age, whereas well, rosé is usually typically drank within three years so our cab franc we're not you know we five to ten years i don't there's to me the a corkscrew has no issue with that you know um but i do think that if uh, at least now i think that if people were paying you know our our cab franc is 32 dollars a bottle um if they ordered it and it came screw cap i think we would be putting certain people off and being the size that we are, I can't afford to put anybody off, you know? So it's more of the, uh, the marketing aspect of it versus that. I don't trust a screw cap. I mean, I, you know, it's that. And then with our reserve coming out, that's there's, you know, I just don't think you can put it. I don't think America is ready for reserve wine in a screw cap. Um, although, other people are doing, you know, much more expensive wines than mine um, in screw caps. I think it's more right now. I think it's still just more mindset. They want the cork screw. They want the cork. I mean, what about the rosé? The rosé is screw cap. Oh, cool. Yeah, the rosé is screw cap. Um, and, and that makes sense. I, yeah. I, I, and that's what's interesting. And like you were saying, Debbie. People don't have that same mind frame for a rosé. They're they're much more willing to accept a rosé in a screw cap. They're much more willing to accept a Sauvignon Blanc, even yeah. though it's not New Zealand, you know, like ours. Well, a drink now. Right. Now right. screw cap. Dollar pork. Right. And um, even, like, um, I just did um, a virtual tasting for uh, with Snooth of Albarino's, and I was expecting them all to be screw caps and there were more corks than there were screw caps. And I, w- I was surprised by that. It's also an old winemaking region too. So, you know, um, there could, there could be that and it could be that they have access to cork 
more so than we would here. Right. Um, there, there could be several factors for that. Yeah. So that, but that goes against the you're going to drink now because Alvarino's are, you know, are drink nows, yeah, are drink nows. You're going to drink young. Right. Although, yes and no, that will age them too. Yeah. It depends on the Alvarino. It depends on the Alvarino, but I definitely have had a few under screw cap, and I think it, but to your point, I think it's sometimes the younger producers doing the screw cap. Uh, I. Yeah. See, now I'm gonna have to go back and look at look at my list of of the wineries and see who the who the things are. Which well, that brings me to another question. So millennials, right? They're all dictating everything that everybody does nowadays. Um, do, do you think they have an opinion? Everybody has an opinion. <laughs> well, my daughter in here on that. <laughs> Um, I don't know. So I, I work in a wine shop as well, and we we have customers of all ages. Definitely, a significant segment is our millennials, and I feel like they're they're pretty open. I still think you get people that are have their biases against the screw cap, but um, but in general, I have found them to be on the whole pretty open about packaging in general. Right. So. So, as I said, I can't get the chat to work, right, out here. So, Nick is watching. <laughs> Hi, Nick. So, he texted me. His his comment is, screw caps are fine, especially for buy-the-glass programs in restaurants <laughs> and those darn millennials. Um, yes, they do have opinions. <laughs> so, um, I, I think that, um, I don't know, I... I I think the bias has kind of gone wayside. I think it's dropped a lot in terms of screw caps. And I think a lot of people have bias of something that they don't understand. And and that's life in general. And when screw caps first started showing up, people were like, no, 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 no. And I, in my head, right off of the top of my head, I can think of four people that I know personally social media who were very adamant. I will never, ever drink anything from a screw cap. Screw cap. I mean, they posted it on Twitter. They posted it on Instagram. And in the war that I get that's in screw cap. Say that again? There's a lot of, I belong to the Oregon Pinot Noir. Oh. There's a lot that I get for screw cap that are screw caps. Right. Yeah. 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 I have to tell you, uh, wine1011 said, I like the glass stoppers. A lot of vineyards are utilizing. All right. So we're going to move on. And the next big bias that I could think of was boxed wines. So what is it? I, I, I honestly I honestly don't even think I've ever had a boxed wine. You've never had a boxed wine? I don't think so. Oh, my gosh. I remember them from college. Yeah. No, I was drinking the party balls, Coors Lights, you know, party balls. No. Oh, the um, beer balls. Yeah. Yeah, I was drinking um, Pastor Meister Prout. <laughs> yeah. Buffalo. But... Those stupid beer party <laughs> balls that you had to buy the special oh, tap man. for. <laughs> With the little spigot thing, just like it is now. Yeah. I don't know. I don't think I've ever had a, I don't think I've ever had a boxed wine. I, I think, why do you think that is? I, I don't know. I just don't think I've ever had it. I, I, I mean, I, I don't know. Have you ever seen them? Yeah, I've seen them. I've seen them. Um, actually, while we were, <laughs> while we were in Bordeaux, um, Fabian, uh, Ryan and I went into, um, whatever store that was that they bought, you know, the, their type of grocery little 7-Eleven type like store and uh, we were going to get beer uh, for when we were done with all the wine at night we were going to cleanse with beer and uh, there was boxed wines on the shelves and we were joking yeah let's you know we're in Bordeaux let's get some boxed wines um, that's probably the closest I've ever gotten to actually picking up a bottle of, uh, or a boxed wine um so I'm going to leave this one to you three. Um, I, it's not so much a bias for me. I just have never, I don't know, maybe it's subcon subconscious bias. So Wine 101 says, um, 
rosé out of a box, can, bottle, and keg this weekend. Oh. I drink a lot of boxed wine. When my husband was in business school, we, we, we went and studied abroad in Australia. And we were kind of broke because we'd spent all our money. To get there? <laughs> yeah. Um, so we drank a lot of boxed wine then. Um, I And it was cheap stuff, so it wasn't the best example. I don't have, like, an inherent bias against it. Um, I actually think it makes a lot of sense. But I have the least experience with boxed wines and have, like, had the, um, like, I, I don't know. I haven't had as many quality options. I haven't had really any quality options. <laughs> but I think that might be just like what's available rather than the box itself. Because so, I don't know that so, that um, black box thing says well again we, we you haven't had black box? No. Oh. That, that says you know in our last wrap up we talked about points versus palette and how as a winery I can set, I can submit my wine like to five competitions a day every day of the year. Um, but you see the commercials for that black box and they're like, Oh, the most awarded gold medals or the most awarded whatever. Um, but I don't know what competitions they're winning, but I have that black box line. I wasn't a fan, but I think that there's a market for it. When you look at the people that buy like yellowtail and that type of wine, I think that that, the box wine goes with that, and it's probably, you know, a value wine. Hey. But then, you know, more people are coming out with stuff. Like, there's wine, like, there's wines and kegs. Yep. You know, and, you know, you can get wine on tap now. So, here's my question, but you can't get, like, oak-aged wines on tap. I would, I would tend to think, would they, um, I don't know if it's, if it's, no, no, you can't, I shouldn't say that, but. I don't know because, you know. it lose its, its, its um, characteristics, if an oaked, say, an oaked age Cabernet on tap, would it lose its characteristics being in a tap versus in the bottle? Well, I don't, I, I don't, if it was aged if it was aged in oak and then bottled, I don't see what would be the difference versus if it was aged in oak and then put in that plastic thing or in a keg. I don't. Okay. I, mean, I don't know. I was throwing it out. I have had um, oak aged wines in can, so I can't see. If, so if it can be in a can, I, I don't see why it couldn't be in a keg. I don't yeah. So when you drink oak aged wine in a can did it have a tin type of it was pretty clean it was really lightly oaked too it was just like a hint so just like enough to give it like a little texture it wasn't very much at all okay so here's so, here's my issue with cans um and it's not this is not um wine in cans i don't like cans I I taste the the metal whatever it is like I you know I buy bottled beer you know um and Mike buy you know when he when I go to California I go in and I open the refrigerator and it's freaking cans and it drives me crazy so he's got to buy bottles when I go there because I don't like the taste of cans so for me I'm not picking up a can of wine, not so much because it's wine in a can versus I personally don't like cans of anything. I, I, I tend to agree with you. There's a certain tang or something with the can that I'm not a big fan of. Um, beer, you know, soft bed, beverage, whatever, I'm just not a big fan of. I think what would be really cool is to do a blind tasting from can, bag, and bottle into a glass yeah. and see what happens. That would be interesting. Right, but you would need to have, like Nicole was doing that vertical of the same wine mm -hmm. in cork and screw cap. You would have to have the same wine in bottle, can, and keg. Uh, 
because Not necessarily you can just say identify the wine that was in the can, identify the wine that was in the box, and identify the wine that was in the bottle. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna pull science geekdom here. When you do when you do a science experiment, you can only have one variable <laughs> that you can test. Um, so like, I who's to say that that wine? You, you know, for me, a science experiment needs to be a science experiment because I'm. I'm a science geek, um, and that's what I was trained for. Um, you know, there's you in my brain. You can't get a statistical analysis that is relevant if you've got more than one variable that you're taste that you're testing. I agree. I said it'd be cool. Oh, it would be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know how that would. I don't know how you'd be able to do that anyway to have that. But I, I understand what you're saying. Sure. Okay. So, with all these packaging types, I think I have, well, except for screw caps, I think of the sort of newer packaging types, I think mm -hmm. I have the most experience with cans. Um, I totally feel you actually on the tin note, like, notice that I, I'm drinking a canned wine, but I poured it in the glass. Because ah. it's still something about it. I kind of agree with you there. That said, like, I, I have found some, like, really lovely versions in cans, I mean, is it going to be the type of thing that you want to age? No, of course not. It's the type of thing that if you are going to a picnic or you're going to hang right. out by a lake or the pool, then all of a sudden it makes a lot more sense. The story I look at happens to be by the lake um, and uh, Bay Grace in Oakland. And um, we, had a, we had a can party, a can can party last year, um, which was really fun. <laughs> <laughs> and we just have, and I think it really works for the particular setting because we're the type of place that people come in on the weekend, pick up. Sometimes they stay, like a lot of people stay and chill because you can also drink there. But um, a lot of people are picking it up to go and take it to a barbecue or to like hang out by a pool or a lake or something. Um, uh, just a little uh, note on this too, which I found kind of, a, a couple of months ago, I went to the Global Garnacha Summit here in Napa. And the... Um, the most heated debate of the day was over a canned wine. They were pouring this like canned rosé. I thought it was lovely. I thought it was delicious. Like for all of the sort of appropriate to all the scenarios that I like, just mentioned. Um, but yeah, a lot of people, a lot of songs and educated palates, even though many people stated how much they needed the wine, they were still kind of hesitant to say, that they, I, I don't know, there was still a lot of pushback in the audience just because it was in a can. can. I found it really, really interesting. Yeah. All right, so has anybody had, you know, you know the Capri Sun? Yes. You know, yeah. Brian, yeah. has anybody ever had the wine like that? No. No. Okay, so. I have not um, tasted it, but I've seen it, and that I have an issue with. I, I, I got sent samples of it. Not a fan. So I, my issue has nothing to, I've never tasted it. Um, my issue with that is I think that's making it too fun and alcohol. I, I mean, we all, I, I we love it. We drink it, whatever, but yeah, it's not, it, I, my issue is that it's making it too much like for little kids to be drinking wine. And that's, that's my issue with that. So I never tasted it. So I don't have a, I don't have a. I was not a fan of it. Mm. Um, and I had some issues on, you know, it was, it was like, what happens if a kid tastes it? Right. Right. Cause a, a child you know, isn't going to think it's a juice pack. Sung, right. Right. Um, so I'm going to chime in again with Nick. Um, Nick says pro for box wines, most glasses taste like the first. So that is, that's, that's what I've understood also. Um, and con, uh, the shelf life is limited. So drink now, don't hide away for this special day. So, and then he says that cans are great for the beach picnics, etc. So because of the ease, like you were saying, cool. And the liner isn't long shelf life. So it actually will go bad um, after nine to 12 months. So that's the plastic, the bladder, right? That, that the box comes in, muscle in? Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, but I, I have had canned wines. Um, and quite honestly, uh, so Fiction in Paso has been making canned wines for, uh, I don't even know how long. For Before cans was even cans, they were doing it. Um, yeah. And it's it's decent wine. Like, I, yeah. you know, it, it's good. But what I find interesting is, um, and what they were talking about, you drink more wine out of the can. <laughs> um, right? Because you're going to drink that whole can. Right? Because you're used to drinking the whole can. Right. Yeah. Right. And yeah. that's, there, and uh, I don't think their cans are 12 ounces. I think their cans are 16 ounces. Is that a 12 ounce can, Nicole? Or? This is, um, I believe so. This is uh, three seven, they put 375 milliliters, so like a half bottle. So a half, half bottle. bottle. So that's yeah. not, that's not, that's not bad. That's not, you're, I mean. I also think when you drink from a can, like when you drink beer from a can, you're right. chugging it. Right. And wine's not meant to be chugged. No, but I think in the can you get a, and Cole poured it into a glass, so that makes it a whole other viewpoint on it. Um, but if you're at the beach, I'm going to say you're going to drink more of it. Because you're just, you're in a can. And put it in that beer cozy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I mean, to their credit, this is, I think, 11.5% alcohol, perhaps accounting for that kind of, um, that kind of consumption. Right. Um, yeah. So this is, I mean, this is, so this is pretty low. I think this is, takes all of that maybe. Into consideration. consideration. Now, I don't think a 375 is, is bad because I think. I think most of us, you, you sit down with your wife, your husband, significant other, whatever, and you drink a bottle of wine. So you're pretty much drinking yeah. a 375, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but that is, but I do think that if you're at a picnic or you're at the beach, I think if you're drinking it physically out of the can, I think you're not thinking as much as what you're drinking. And I think it will be a bigger consumption. Um, so, um, all right. This one I have a little um, kind of issue with uh, because I guess by definition it is us. Um, but maybe, I don't know. So critter labels. So labels that have animals on them. Okay. Um, a critter label, by definition, is any label that features an animal. So we have Draco, so I guess we are considered a critter. Um, in 2006, a New York Times article stated that nearly one in five labels actually features an animal. And we all know the king of the critter labels is Yellowtail. So I also know that when we were first developing our brand and doing all that, I had read research that said that people who are not wine people, people who are going into a wine shop and just grabbing a bottle for that night to drink, just to give it a try, choose their label within eight seconds. So wine producers... It has to pop out. What? It has to pop out. Yes. So we have, as a producer, we have eight seconds to catch your eye. And apparently animals do a very good job. Um, so what's your thoughts on critter labels? So an, an eight second fly, that, that particular person is really just, I guess that person is not really wine centric. Yeah, really no, that's exactly, wine. the article was about people who are just going in, they're not wine people. Okay. They're just going in and I need a bottle for tonight. I don't know anything about wine. I don't want to ask for help. I'm going to pick a bottle. Okay. So not knowing a whole lot about beer, I will gravitate towards cool labels. So there's that. So I, knowing that and, and confess, confessing that, uh, I understand when, when people do that. When you're, when you go to a wine shop, um, you're faced with thousands of, possibility of thousands of bottles mm -hmm. um and if a wine shop owner is not there to help you uh, 
um, or possibly is, you may gravitate towards a bottle that is cute. It's your personality or it looks cute, or I, I totally understand that. Um, in regards to Yellowtail, I'm not opposed to the critter label per se. What I'm opposed to is that garish yellow. I hate that color. I hate that color. <laughs> but I think for a lot of people, um, especially for like Burgundy, Bordeaux, the more classic examples of wine labels, I do think a lot of people shy away from them because they think it's, they're going to be too complex. They're not going to understand those particular wines, regardless of the fact that they're European wines. Um, well, with that being said, I think you bring up a good point on a wine label like a Burgundy or a Bordeaux. It's complicated where they're going to go for the visual, pleasy, easy. I like that. Mm -hmm. Other than, I got to figure this out. Where's it from? How am I going to explain it? You know, whole whole I ordeal of really reading the label. Right. But I do think it's also situational too. If they're just bringing a bottle to a party, they're going to grab something fun. If they're going to be grabbing a more expensive, bo expensive bottle for a gift, they may gravitate, and I think most people do, yeah. towards the more classic. Uh, yeah, you're right. I agree with you. I, I think I have to agree with all of that. It's, it's. I mean, as far as the critter wines, I, I, I feel like, well, I definitely have been there, done that. <laughs> um, I can't deny I drank them back in the day. Um, and I'm gonna, and I'm not gonna lump all of wines with animals on them into the same category. But um, thank, you. I, thank you, thank you, thank <laughs> you. Exactly. Um, but I, I mean. I, I guess thinking back, there is probably something to be said for those wines that are kind of friendly and easy to understand um, as gateway wines. Mm -hmm. yeah. So maybe let's give them credit for that. <laughs> so that that is Nicole exactly what I was going to say. Is so when Mike and I first started getting into wine, you know, we were working at Unilever. We both, you know you don't make a lot of money when you're first out of college. Um, so we weren't going out to dinner. Our date nights were, you know, we got together and he cooked. I'm very lucky. He cooked. Um, and we would walk to the local wine shop and we would pick a bottle of wine. And I would say in that, when we first started dating that first year, we picked label. I know I picked labels by, ooh, there's a frog, ooh, there's a butterfly, ooh, there's, you know, you know, green and yellow and, you know, whatever. Um, Visually appealing. What? Mm -hmm. Visually appealing. Yes, to yes. And we drank it and, you know, didn't really, we drank it. We didn't appreciate it. As we progressed and as our wallets increased in our professions, you know, we started to realize that, okay, well, we can come off of that bottom shelf now. And then we started reading and educating ourselves. And then we would read something about a winery and we're like, oh, okay, let's try that. And we would physically go and hunt down a bottle. Um, so I do agree. I think there, you know, those types of wines are, are, great for gateway and introduction and I'm not by all saying that they're not quality you know people might love them and stay that way stay there um, but I I think that they do they're there for the quick grab they're you know they're a mass pro larger production bottles I think what I take offense um, at is the those particular critter labels that take advantage of that, those wineries, and they produce an inferior product, but put a label on that that catch people's eyes. Um, that's that's what I take offense to. An inferior product. And kind of building off of that, um, I, I do have to. Say, I mean, granted, I went through the exact same progression that you were talking about, Lori. I I, I tried all of the things, right? I drank Chubop Chuck, I drank <laughs> Carlo Rossi, I drank Yellowtail, Fox Wine, etc. Um, but now having, I mean, granted, I have dedicated a lot of time to 
educating myself in this, but um, I think there's some amazing wines out there for $15 mm-hmm. that are totally accessible to people. If you're willing to use like your wine shop, um, if you go to a good wine shop and you, um, you know, if, if you are willing to use the song at a restaurant um, and tell them specifically your price point, I think, um, I think there are great wines at value, at value price points. You might have to step a little out of your comfort zone into like a grape that uh, you might not know or a region you don't know, but uh, like there's super well, like super delicious wild wines out there. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. And and I think that is a whole. Uh, well, I guess bias isn't the right word, but I think a lot of people who are new to the wine world are nervous to go into a wine shop and ask what should... They feel intimidated and they shouldn't feel that way. Um, because that's what the people are there to help you. Right. right. But, um, but then on the flip side, you have to really explain what you're looking for. What, yeah. You know, how it wants. Is it sweet or is it fruity? Yeah. Yeah. That's the problem. A lot of people don't understand that my Right. Mind. I know, I know. Right. But yeah, no, and, and ha- I can't speak for every wine shop, but that is like something we pride ourselves on. So, like, it's just, and I know a lot of other wine shops that feel the same way. People or friends that work at different wine shops that, like, you know, that's what we're there for. Right, but just because you're there doesn't mean everybody feels comfortable asking. It, you know, the the old joke of you know men never ask for directions. Yeah. You know. Um, I would, you know, this person rather just go in and pick this and go off than to say, admit, listen, I don't really know what, what, you know. Um. But for for your wine shop, though, um, you're going to have in your restaurant, you're, you guys are going to have stuff in there that's quality stuff. I mean, I think that's the case in a lot of places. But I think yeah. but you're right. It, it requires going, like, it requires making yourself vulnerable in a way that, for whatever reason, people I don't, people with wine still feel intimidated. And, right. and I, I get it. Uh, you know what? I think that intimidation comes from us in the industry, too. A lot of it really do. I think we actually that. And I don't think we understand that we are, but we do. But also, I have to tell you an experience that I had at a wine shop that I used to frequent all the time when I lived in New York. And I went in one time and I said, you know, to the manager who knew me and, you know, you know, what do you have that's new and exciting and good? You know, him knowing my, you know, what I like. And he, I can't remember the name, the wine that he gave me, but I brought it home that evening and opened it. And to me, it was not, it was not my palate. It was definitely a... I don't want to say on the lines of a yellowtail, but it was definitely not, you know, for me. So I think that it was something that he wanted to push. Oh, well, that's bad. It might have been a price point. So I think, you know, you really need to know the person at the lift store. I mean, yes. I don't know why. And both my husband and I was like, why did he, you know, suggest this? He knows us. Right. That's you know, sad. We, if that's what you, if that really, if he's just pushing it, then, then that's just so you, yeah. horrible. But yeah. really try and find somebody that you can truly trust. Right. That knows your palate or has a similar palate as you. Right. And, you know, there's, um, where I buy, where I buy most of my wine, um, there's a woman there and, you know, she's recommended things. And I would say, you know, nine out of 10 wines, she's spot on. I like them, but every so often, you know, she, she recommended a wine, um, you know, and I was, I was explaining what I was looking for and she recommended a wine and I tasted it. I was like, this is nowhere near what I was explaining, what I wanted. Um, but then other wines, She's been spot on. Yeah. So, you know. It's bound to happen. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so I hope that that person wasn't trying to push what he took in 
you know, 20 cases of, because that's, that's just unethical. That, that's a whole other, <laughs> that's a whole other thing. Um, all right. So any other biases we want to, we want to talk about? Cause we are getting close to the hour and I try to not take up too much of your time. The, we're going to talk about the flying bottle. We're going to talk about that. The 40 ouncer. All right. We, yeah. we will, we will bring up that 40 ouncer. Um, <laughs> So the 40 ounce rosé, um, apparently flying off of the shelves everywhere. Um, but thoughts, thoughts on the 40 ouncer. Okay. I think this is a little, this one's a little difficult because I understand where the criticism is coming from and okay. I want to be sensitive. Sorry, the criticism of, um, drill of division sometimes is trouble that is, um, where that one comes from. Um, but Maybe this is Pollyanna of me, but I kind of want to believe that in a lot of cases, um, it's like resonating with people on a different level. Like to me, it speaks to me personally. It speaks to like, I, okay, I should also say, I think the wine's okay. It's fine. It's not great, but it's fine. Um, but I think the packaging probably like to me kind of, resonates with like that time period in my life like, that we kind of all have discussed already like in terms of like you know drinking box wines and 40 ounce beers and etc cetera, etc cetera. Yeah. and that's like it was in my personal experience and so taking something this like memory that you know maybe you look back on it now and you kind of roll your eyes at yourself in your 20s or whatever um and it kind of makes it cool i, I kind of get it but that's what he was going for yeah, I think that's what he's going for. So I think I, I don't think that um, I I don't think the negative criticism against it, but I think that it probably is resonating with people on a broader level. Yeah, yeah I agree. I agree. I think that I think that that went in a whole other direction um, than what was initially presented um and that's our society <laughs> you know um going in uh, you know going in a direction and looking for the biggest i guess way to attack or biggest way to be negative about something um again i'm going to go back to my my response when it was um presented on social media because I was asked as a winemaker, does that upset me? And as a winemaker, no, you can, you can make whatever wine you want to make and you can do what you want to do. So it doesn't, it doesn't insult me as a winemaker. It doesn't, um, it doesn't upset me as a winemaker. Um, what I went back to was it looks like soda. It does. It looks like it looks like a, a and that a, goes a, back to the juicy, you know, the Capri Sun wine. Yeah. That that's, that's what good. bothered me. But I get I get that too. Yeah. I will just also throw out there that I, I think the uh, the Muscadet, the white wine version, is a lot better than the rosé. Oh, is it? Uh, <laughs> see, now I didn't even see the white. I I've only seen the rosé. So my question here is: it, Is it a skewer rosé or is it a dry? Um, it's been a while since I've had it, but dry oh, over a year, but it was dry. Yeah. It was dry. Yeah. yeah. yeah it's perfectly really fine. It's really fine. Nothing wrong with the juice. It's, it's just the packaging. And, um, well, I think that that would tell say a certain market over. And yeah. and I I mean I don't really want to get. I don't really want to get into that aspect of it, but I think that was what the biggest issue was, was where certain people's mindset went of the population of people who drink 40 ounces. <laughs> um, and I think that caused a lot of issues because after the whole, look at this, would you drink it? Then all these other comments started coming in 
which made me research more. And I think there was more issue on that than on the fact that it was wine in, in that bottle. But makes sense. There's a lot of that going around. Sure. Yeah. You know, and it is, I, you know, I don't, people are going to take things where people want to take them, whether it was meant to be that way or not meant to be that way. Um, it is what it is. Um, do yes, yeah. they do. Yes, they do. All right. So are we ready for riddle time? Sure. Okay. All right. So um, I was standing by a railing watching a ship a-sailing. What is the captain's name? If you don't know his name, it's you to blame. What is the captain's name? It's too late and too many glasses of wine. I'll, I'll say it. I'll, I'll say it one more time. And it might be that it's too late because I actually, when I found this one, I knew the answer right away. Um, but okay, so I was standing by a railing, watching a ship a sailing. What is the captain's name? If you don't know his name, it is you to blame. What is the captain's name? Do do. I'm visualizing it, and I, I... We're going to start the countdown. Five, four, three, two, one. No? What? The captain's what? name is what? <laughs> what? What? The captain's name is what? I was standing by a railing. Watching a ship a sailing. What is the captain's name? If you don't know his name, it is you to blame. What is the captain's name? What? <laughs> Tina, Tina, your face is awesome. Oh my god. Oh dear. This is like Abbott and Costello. Yes. <laughs> Who's on first? Yes. Yes. <laughs> All right. So we we are at that time where it is wrap up time where you get a minute or so to plug whatever the heck you want to plug. So I'm just going to go left to right on my screen. So Debbie, you're up first. I'm up first. I'm Debbie Giaquindo. I'm the Hudson Valley Wine Goddess. You can find me at HudsonValleyWineGoddess.com. And if you are ever in the South Jersey area, you can come visit me at Kitchen 330. I mean, we open restaurant that I'm partnered at. And um, if you're going to the Hudson Valley, you can buy my book, Tapping the Hudson Valley, Day Trips and Weekend Itineraries, taking you to all the craft beverage groups. All right, Nicole. Okay, so um, you can find me on um, Instagram and online at The Nibbling Gypsy and Song Table or the song table on Instagram. Um, but the thing I want to plug today is a uh, event that I am working on called the Bachinage Forum. It is a um, women-centric, um, women-positive event happening in Napa on July 28th. Um, and we have an amazing lineup of presenters and um, fabulous women-focused um, wineries pouring. Um, yeah, so check us out at bachinageforum.com. And so, Tina? What do you got? Yeah, so um, I own and produce um, a company called Wine Studio. It's beverage education and grassroots rock marketing on the Twitter platform. Um, June, we're all about um, rosé and its design influence on wine labels. Um, so we're talking about wine labels and art on wine labels. Oh. Wine, wine makers are doing that. So that's every Tuesday night, uh, 9 to 10 p.m. Awesome. Twitter. Awesome. And I'm Lori, Dracina Wines. I don't know. Um, I write a blog. I won the Melissa May Award, which I'm very excited about. So I got to go to Bordeaux, and I get to go to Bordeaux again on Friday. So I'm very, very excited. And I think I'm breaking the world records for only being in Bordeaux for 24 hours and coming back home, sadly. Um, but I'm excited to be going as an ambassador for Clerc uh, Mion, uh, who are doing the uh, dance awards. So I'm happy to do that. 
And next Monday is the third Monday of the month. So that means that Debbie and I will be together on Winefabet Street. And we are doing the letter M. I cannot believe we've been on Winefabet Street for a year and a month, 13 months. Um, and we will be discussing um, Mencia. Um, so next week on this same time, uh, 8 p.m., will be Wine for no. Bed Street. Yeah. Thank you, Debbie, Nicole, and Tina, for joining. Uh, the last thing is next month's um, wrap-up is going to be on July 9th. And I thought that since, you know, it was right after the 4th of July and I know Memorial Day is kind of the beginning of the unofficial beginning of summer, but since I'm still in school, I don't consider it summer. Um, so <laughs> since it's uh, after July 4th, next month's episode is going to be summer must-haves. So what wines do you think are must-haves during your summer? So... Thank you for joining. Thank you, Lori. Thank you, Lori. Thanks for listening to Dracina Wines Podcast. If you have suggestions on what topics you would like us to discuss, please reach out to us on social media. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, YouTube, Facebook, Snapchat, Google, and Periscope as at Dracina Wines. I am also on LinkedIn as Lori Hoyt Bud, or email us at DracinaWines.com. If you enjoyed our podcast, please subscribe and leave us a review on your favorite podcast catcher to help others find us more easily. We are found on all of your favorite aggregators. To subscribe easily to iTunes, go to bit.ly forward slash Dracina podcast. That's B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash Dracina podcast. And that's a capital D for Dracina and capital P for podcast. Please check out our award-winning wines and find out about our wine club at DracinaWines.com. And remember to always pursue your passion. Slancha.